the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for the men and women who have sacrificed and gave their lives for our freedom. We pray that you bless them this day. Also, God, we thank you for Jesus who gave the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom, Lord. Free to come into the house of God and worship you. Free to love you, to hear your word, God. Today, Father, as we open up your word, we pray that you would open it up to us. God, give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. Lord, may we be the good ground where the word is sown that produces something in each and every one of our lives individually. God, we thank you for that privilege and for that honor. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves, but also we would ask it on all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We love them, Lord. We don't think of ourselves as better than them, but as co-laborers together with them in your field, building your kingdom. God, we pray that you would bless them as you bless us this day. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, Amen. amen. You may be seated. Today, as you get your Bibles and go with me to Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to be going into verse number 11, and today I want to talk to you about an exclusive life. The title of today's message is An Exclusive Life. We're going to find out what that means as we read through Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 11, and we've been talking about Jesus, we've been talking about us, we've been talking about sufferings, and how the sacrifice and the sufferings that Jesus went through, now we share in those things. And then we come to verse number 11 of Hebrews, the second chapter. And it says this, it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, we're going to stop right there at verse number 11 because we read through some things and there's some big words in there that oftentimes if we're not careful, we'll skip right over. How many of you, like Pastor Dan, have ever read something, you didn't understand it and you just kept going because maybe you'll understand something else? Okay, anybody honest? All right, good. There's a couple of you guys that are truthful out there. The rest of you guys, we'll we'll pray for you. But I know for me personally, there have been times where I've read through the Bible and I haven't quite understood something, and I I said, well, you know what, I I didn't quite get that, but you know, I do get this down here, so I'll just keep reading, and, and I'll feel good about this down here. And yet God doesn't want us to skip over things. There's a reason why we teach line upon line, precept upon precept in this church, and that's to get an understanding and to deal with the issues that God is bringing up to us in his word. Now, there's a great word up there called sanctifies, and also the word sanctified. Really, it talks about our sanctification. Now, that's a big word. It's a Christianese word, if you will. It's one of those words that people use in church, and, and, and maybe you've heard that word before, and you didn't understand what it meant, and you thought, well, I guess maybe by coming to church, I'll kind of get a hold of what that concept really is all about and find out what sanctified means so that maybe someday I, I'll be able to use it in a sentence too, you know? And, and, and I don't know if we, we think that maybe by osmosis or something that it'll just kind of sink down into our head or God will download it to us or something like that, but God wants us to find out what it is. Maybe we're too lazy to get a dictionary. Maybe we're too lazy to go find out what it means. But you know what? Today, we're going to hit this topic head on of what it means that we are sanctified. Now, I want you to know something. It says that for both he who sanctifies, and there's a capital H in the word he, so that's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the one who sanctifies. And then it goes on to say, and those who are being sanctified. Now, that's talking about you and talking about me. So we are being sanctified. So there's something that has taken place already. Jesus has sanctified us, but we are also in the middle of a process. We are being sanctified. So what does being sanctified mean? Because we're never going to understand this verse unless we first define what it means to be sanctified. I'm going to put a definition up on the overhead for you. You can write it down or take a look at it. Here's what it means. To be sanctified means that you are set apart. The very first definition that we have of being sanctified means set apart. It means that when you were born again, when you gave your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, that Jesus took you and he set you apart from the rest of the world. There was something special about you, something different about you, that now you are set apart unto God. You are now God's sanctified people. You are the set apart people. Now, that doesn't mean that he took you out of the world because how many of you noticed when you got saved, you didn't just bang, beam me up, Jesus, now you're in heaven and you're no longer here on the earth. You stayed here. So that means that it doesn't mean separation in the sense of physical distance, but rather what it means is that you are sanctified or you are set apart unto God. Now there's a special thing that's on your life. Also, in our definition, it means that you are sanctified, set apart, and you are holy, holy unto the Lord. There's another one of those church words. What does it mean to be holy? When you look at the root word for being sanctified, you'll find out it's the same root word for being 
Holy means that you are holy unto the Lord. You are a special people, that you are, simply put, exclusively His. That's the real definition that we use in this church of being sanctified, to be set apart, or what it means to be holy is that you are exclusively His. At the moment of salvation, your life is no longer your own, but now your life is exclusively God's. But in addition to that, God's life is exclusively yours. It's a beautiful relationship, and it's something that we need to learn about and something that we need to look at. We're going to explore this today. Looking back at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, again with this understanding, we see that it says, Hebrews 2, verse 11, for both he who sanctifies, so Jesus is the one that sanctifies us. He sets us apart. He makes us holy unto the Lord. Jesus is the one that makes us exclusively his. So at the moment of salvation, we're set apart exclusively for God. We are sanctified. But if you read on in the verse, you notice there's another aspect of our sanctification. It says, for he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified. So we have a part to play in this. There is a process that we are in the middle of, and that is that we are being sanctified. Even though we are something already, now we are growing and we are in a process. We are moving forward in our sanctification. In our lives, we are set apart and holy unto God. We are exclusively His. Let me put it to you this way. Sanctified is what we are and should be how we act. Let me say that again. Sanctified is what we are. We are exclusively His, but it also should be how we act. should be the expression of our lives. So today, we're going to find out about what an exclusive life looks like couple of things that I believe that God gave me today to share with you about an exclusive life. If we're going to live this life out, one thing to know that we are sanctified, set apart, holy unto God, that we are exclusively His, but it's another thing when we take a look at what is our part to play in this thing? What is the process that we're going through? How do I work that process? How do I live an exclusive life to God? Today, would you like to know about how to do that? I'm glad that maybe a quarter of you do. For the rest of you, hang on tight because you're going to get it too. Today, an exclusive life is a, number one, a complete life. It is a complete life. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. We give God exclusive privilege in our lives. If you ever heard of somebody say, I've got an exclusive timeshare on the beach, man. I, I, I've got an exclusive timeshare. What does that mean? That means that there is other people that don't have access to that timeshare. means that they've got the privilege rights to go into that place and to use the resources that are there in that place. So they have something exclusive. It means that not everybody gets a hold of this. Not everybody gets involved in this. So if you're going to live an exclusive life to God, a complete life for God, that means that when God comes into your heart, there is no rooms in your heart that you have posted a sign on the door that says no entrance. You get what I'm saying? See, oftentimes our attention is divided because even though we are in the world, we are not of the world, but we still have to operate in the world even though we're not of the world. Have I totally confused you yet? <laughs> but you see, our attention is divided. We know that we have to work. We know that we have to provide. We know that there are things that we desire. There are things that we want. There's relationships we're involved in. There's places that we go. There's things that we see and that we do. And our attention gets divided. And our heart oftentimes we find has places that we say, you know what, God, you can come in, have free reign, just don't touch this area of my life. God, you can have all of me, just stay away from my pocketbook. God, everything I have is yours, just don't touch this relationship, Lord, because I had that one before I got saved and now I'm bringing it in. You see, God doesn't want us to live a divided life. No, God wants a complete life, all of your heart, all of your life, everything that you are completely open and devoted and exclusively His. God wants exclusive privilege into your heart and into your life. I like how C.S. Lewis described it. He was talking about when he was a child and if he had a toothache, he wouldn't immediately run to his mom for pain medication until the pain was unbearable. He writes these words. He says, the reason I did not go was this. I didn't doubt she would give me the aspirin. I knew she would also do something else. I knew she would take me to the dentist the next morning. I could not get what I wanted out of her without getting something more, which I did not want. I wanted immediate relief from my pain, but I could not get it without having my teeth set permanently right. And I knew those dentists. I knew they would start fiddling about with all sorts of other teeth which had not yet begun to ache. Our Lord is like the dentists. 
Dozens of people go to him to be cured of some particular sin. Well, he'll cure it all right, but he will not stop there. That may be all you asked, but if once you call him in, he will give you the full treatment. See, our Lord isn't going to take a look at your life, and when you bring something to him, you say, Lord, there's this problem that I have. There's this thing that I'm facing. There's, there's something going on. God, I want you to deal with this right here, God. God will say, oh, you want me to deal with this? Well, let's trace this back, and let's find out where the root of the... Oh, here it is over here. And you say, God, don't touch that. I wanted you to deal with this, God. And God says, I am dealing with this. This is the root. I like how one pastor put it to me one time. He said, where there is a fruit, there is also a root. And until you deal with the root of the issue, you're always going to have the fruit. You see, we can't expect God to deal here unless God can get down and get deep into our lives, get into the recesses of our heart and get his hands on the issue, get his finger on the problem and start to deal with that issue in our heart. Yeah, it may be painful in the process of yanking that thing out and pulling that thing out of our heart, but in the end... God will deal with the issues in our life. Now, let me show this to you in the Word. You're going to see something in the Bible in a moment. Turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, a couple books back from Hebrews. And in 1 Thessalonians, last chapter in 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 5, we're going to take a look at a verse that shows us the complete person that you are and how this person is set apart wholly and exclusively God's. Now, let me describe something to you, because maybe you've never been taught this, but you are you, right? When you take a look at yourself, you know yourself. When you take a look at a person, you see their physical body. That's the first thing that you see when you see a person, okay? So you are physical. You have a body, right? But you know that it doesn't just stop there, that there's something on the inside of that. People have a mind. They have a will. They have emotions. So there is a soul realm to a person, and then we go to the Bible and we find out that there is also a spirit man. So let me describe it to you like this. You are a spirit who has a soul that lives in a body. Okay? Now you are a three-part being, just like God is a three-part being. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, yet one God. Okay? In the same way God made man in his own image, so you are spirit, soul, and body. Three parts to one being. Okay? When you're born again, your spirit is born again. You are made brand new. What's born of the spirit is spirit. What's born of the flesh is flesh, Jesus said. So our spirit man is what is born again. We are renewed in our spirit when we're born again. But now we still have the mind, and the mind needs to be renewed. Okay, you've, you've got to go to the word and, and, and get the washing of the water by the word. You've got to start cleaning up your thinking. Right? Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God, which is your reasonable service. And that you are not conformed to this world, but are transformed by what? By the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. So our spirit is renewed, our mind is being renewed, and the Bible tells us that our body will be renewed. The book of 1 Corinthians, it tells us not all will sleep, but all will be transformed. So our bodies, even if Jesus comes, we're going to get a new body. Oh, glory to God. See, so our spirits are renewed, our mind is being renewed, and our body will be renewed. You are a three-part being. Now, God doesn't want just your spirit. Even though he wants your spirit, he doesn't want to stop there. God may have you born again and you're brand new and God's got your spirit but God also wants your mind renewed to the things of God he doesn't want that filthy thinking staying in there that stinking thinking I like, I like that because it helps me to remember so God starts getting us the word of God to get our minds renewed and then God wants it to be played out in our bodies in the things that we say and the things that we do in the expressions of our life God wants our physical bodies to glorify him Okay, now remember I said I'm going to show this to you in one verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse number 23. Take a look at it with me, okay? You're going to see spirit, soul, and body being set apart, holy, sanctified unto the Lord, completely, exclusively his. Verse 23 of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. So there's God setting us apart, making us holy, exclusively his, and he says, Completely, And then he goes on to define what he means. Look at this. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, spirit, soul, and body. God wants all of you. God doesn't want just half of you. 
God doesn't want a portion of you. God doesn't want just a little dabble, do you? Every Sunday morning I come to church, God, what more do you want? God wants it all, church. God wants all of your heart, all of your life, spirit, soul, and body. God says, give it all to me. If you're going to live a holy life, if you're going to live a sanctified life, a set-apart life, God wants your complete life. There's no areas that you're closed off to God. So an exclusive life, number one, is a complete life. Second thing today, an exclusive life is a concentrated life, a concentrated life. That means that we give God exclusive attention of our life. So not only does God have exclusive privilege in our lives, but now we give God exclusive attention of our lives. Did you know that God wants to speak to you? God wants to talk to you each and every moment of each and every day. The Bible tells us that we have the exclusive attention of God, that every person on the planet at the same time could be talking to God, and God has the capacity and the ability to listen and hear and know and speak with each and every person at the same time. I don't know how God does that, but he is big enough that he can do that, and God is able to do that. The Bible tells us that God thinks about us so much each and every day that his thoughts towards us could not be numbered as the sand on the seashore. Each and every moment of each and every day, God is intimately involved in your life, in your family, in your job, in your business, in your ministry, in each and every thought that you have, each and every action you do, when you tie your shoes, when you brush your teeth, when you're asleep, God is watching over you. You have the exclusive attention of God. And now God is saying that I want your exclusive attention. See, just like in my marriage, my wife and I, my wife is over here on the front row, and my wife and I, oftentimes at the end of a long day, we'll come and we'll sit down in bed and we'll watch some TV. And, you know, sometimes we'll just want to turn our brain off a little, so we'll play games on our phone or, you know, we'll, we'll go and check emails or, you know, do different things on our phone, that, that sort of a thing. And so we're sitting there in bed, and then one of us will want to talk. And the other one will be watching TV or the other one will be sitting there doing their thing on the phone, you know? And when we talk to one another, we don't want, hey, you know, so I was thinking about this. Uh-huh. Or, hey, what do you think about that? Well, um, huh? You know, that's not exclusive attention. That's divided attention. Oftentimes, that's going to start a fight. God wants us to get rid of distractions, to get things out of the way, and to give our exclusive attention to him. God wants to speak to you. God wants to speak to you in church. God wants to speak to you in your prayer times. God wants to speak to you through his word. Primarily, you're going to find that when you open up the Bible, God is speaking to you. See, what sets us apart from all other religions and all other peoples on the earth is that we have the word of God that we have available to us. God wants to speak to you through his word. This is not just a holy book. This is not just writings of some man. This is the word of God speaking into your life audibly to you when you open it up and when you read it and when you find out the will of God for your life, God is speaking directly to you. When you approach the word of God, don't approach it as just common. Oh, I know that. Oh, I've heard that verse. I've heard that preached. I've, I've read that. I've memorized that. Listen, God wants to speak a direct word into your life through the avenue of his word. Let me show it to you in the book of John. Jesus is praying. He's praying for his disciples. Gospel of John, chapter number 17. John chapter 17, he's praying for his disciples, and really he's praying for us too because we're disciples of Jesus. In John chapter 17, verse number 16. Look at what Jesus prays for us. He says in John chapter 17, verse number 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. What is that? That's a set-apart life. That's a holy life. That's an exclusive life. So they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Jesus was called the Holy One of Israel. He was the anointed one. He was the Messiah. Jesus came into the world, and yet he was not of this world. And now he says that they, the disciples, those that are following Jesus now, are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Look at verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. So he says, God, I want you to set them apart by the avenue of your truth truth. And then he defines what truth is. Take a look at what it says. Your word is truth. So if you ever had a question, you ever wondered what truth was, because, you know, out there in the world, you're going to get messed up. 
There's going to be people tell you, well, that's your truth. I've got my truth. Listen, what's true for you is not true for me. That is not a true statement. You know how I know? Because Jesus defined truth. He said, your word is truth. Truth is not your experience. Truth is not what I think. Truth is not what a couple people get together and agree on. No, truth is what the word of God says to us. This is truth. I'm getting some weak claps right now, but listen, you know it's the truth. Why? Because it's in red letters in your Bible. Jesus said it. But it's so contrary to what the world says. But listen, we are not of this world. Now we have a new nature. We are set apart from the world. We are holy unto God. We are exclusively his. And God is speaking to us through his word. God gives us everything we need, the Bible says, for life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of God. When you get into the word, you're going to get the answer to your problem. You want to find out how to deal with your family, how to have a good marriage, how to have godly children, success. You want to find out how to, how to run your business. You want to find out what your life should look like, how to deal with people in the marketplace, how to handle conflict. Listen, it's all contained in the Word. It's all contained in the Bible. This is the manual. This is the guide. If you have ever tried to put something together without the manual, you know what I'm talking about. You're just going to get frustrated. You're just going to waste time, going to waste energy, waste effort, and the results are not going to be what you want them to be. So we go with the guide. I like what Ronald Reagan said. He said, within the covers of the Bible are all the answers for all the problems men face. The Bible can touch hearts, order minds, and refresh souls. Listen, that's what this is about, is us giving God our exclusive attention. So an exclusive life, number one, is a complete life. Number two, an exclusive life is a concentrated life. And the final thing for today, an exclusive life is a cleaned life. When we talk about sanctification, when we talk about being holy, holy living is important to God and to us. God says that without holiness, we can't even see God. Therefore, Jesus sets us apart, sanctifies us, makes us holy, makes us exclusively his, but also we have a part to play in cleaning up our act as Christians. Now, I'm going to show this to you in the Word because the Bible gives us a, a lot of things about living a holy life and about our responsibility. Oftentimes, people say, God... Clean me up. Well, yeah, he cleans you up. You're born again. You're brand new. You've got a clean slate. But now you're still living in this flesh body with the sin nature in it, and you've got to start doing some things with your life. And so to live a clean life, we've got to give God exclusive obedience with our life. When God says it, we hear it, and then we do it. Why? Because the book of James tells us that faith without works is dead. It's inactive. It's unproductive. And therefore, we have to give God exclusive obedience with our lives. Turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy. You were there in 1 Thessalonians. A couple books back from 1 Thessalonians is 2 Timothy. And Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's, he's giving him some warnings about some false teachers and some people who are distorting the truth. And right in the middle of that, he starts to kind of take a little sidestep, and he starts to speak a little parable. Really kind of cool. And in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, we're going to take a look at verse number 19 and read through verse number 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse number 19, says this, says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Now stop right there and look up at me for a second. God knows the people that are real Christians. God knows your heart. God's got your number. He knows where you live. God knows where you were. God knows those that are his. We understand that. We agree with that. We accept that. But the solid foundation of the Lord has another inscription on it that seals it. Take a look at it with me. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And remember, those, those little words in the Bible oftentimes are the most power-packed words. In other words, not only does God know those who are his and... Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So there is a God side that God knows those who are his. God sanctifies both he who sanctifies, but there's also a man side of those who are being sanctified. Those that are his, let those who name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior depart from iniquity. Now, what is iniquity? Iniquity is sin. Iniquity is those things that displease God. Iniquity is missing the mark. So you and I, if we name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are to depart from iniquity. If you ever wondered why you still sin after you became a Christian, this is the reason why. 
is because there is a choice that we have to make, and we don't always make the right choice. Listen, I'll be the first one to confess. I don't always make the right choices. Just ask my wife. But we have a part to play. We are to depart from iniquity. The Bible tells us to hate that which is evil. Get away from it. Get it out of your life. Do something about the word of God that you've heard. Don't just let it sink into your head. Let it get down into your heart and then come out of your actions. Remember, this is not just about your spirit, not just about your soul, but it's also about your body being sanctified, that you glorify God in the works that you do. Let's read on. Look at what it says in verse number 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Now, we understand that analogy. In a great house, there are vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. In our house, we have a vessel of honor. It's called the special person plate. The special person plate is a red plate with white lettering that says you are a special person today. Birthdays, different days like that where we're honoring somebody, we bring that plate out, we put their food on it, we even sing them a song. I know it's kind of cheesy, but listen, that's just how we honor people. That is a vessel of honor that we bring out. But listen, you might bring out the fine china when the guests are over, but you don't put your plunger in the china cabinet. Hopefully you don't. Why? Because that is a vessel of dishonor. That is not an honorable thing. You don't just bring that out when the company comes over unless you need to. (laughs) But that's a vessel of dishonor. Okay, we understand that. Verse number 21. Therefore, or in other words, because of what I just said about departing from iniquity, about the vessels of honor and dishonor, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself. Remember, a lot of times we say, God, clean me up. God, clean up my act. God, I can't get over this sin. God, I keep dealing with this same thing. God, why don't you do something about it, God? God says, well, I got my hand on the issue. I got my hand on the root. But now, child, get your hand on the root as well with me, and we'll pull it out together. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, you've got a part to play in this process. And your sanctification, God will do everything in his power to clean you up. And now you've got to work together with the Holy Spirit in your life. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, what is the latter? That is those dishonorable things. That is those things that do not bring honor to God or to yourself. Those shameful things, those deeds of darkness that we used to do. And we all know we all used to do them. We were all messed up in the world. Some of us were more messed up after we got saved than we were before. And we hated ourselves for it, right? And yet God is saying, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, take a look at what happens when we cleanse ourselves. He will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set apart, holy unto God, exclusively his, and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Many times we go to God and we say, God, I just want to be used by you. God, take all of me, all that I am, all that I have, Lord, and use it for your glory. God, use me, Lord. And God says, okay, I want to use you, but let's get you cleaned up first, child. Let's start dealing with some issues in your life. Why? Because God never develops the ministry until he's first developed the minister. You see, God is going to get your life in order so that when you go out and when you minister to others, they will see a holy life. They will see a separate life. They will see a life that is exclusively God's, completely God's, concentrated on God. All of our attention is to heaven and a cleaned life unto God. There was a time when I was camping up in the mountains. We were up in a high elevation. There was snow. And so we camped on some dry ground, and then there was snow. Uh, If we went maybe a couple hundred yards. Remember, one of the guys was going to go have some snow. He's going to go eat some snow, you know. And so he went and grabbed a shovel from another guy's tent, grabbed that shovel, ran off, and he started chipping away at the snow because it was really ice, you know. It was snow all packed together. And so he's chipping away and, and getting himself some snow to eat. And the guy that owned the shovel came walking up, and he looked, took a look, and he said, um, what are you doing with my shovel? And he says, I'm getting some snow to eat. And he said, not with my shovel. And he said, why not? He said, because that's the shovel I use when nature calls. <laughs> How many of you know my friend threw the shovel, ran and got himself a clean spoon, and came back to a different spot, right? Why? Because that wasn't useful. 
You and I, as we clean up our lives, as we get our act together, as we get in line with the Word of God, maybe the first time you read the Bible, you were here and the Bible was here and you said, man, I, I don't know if I can agree with that. I don't know if I can accept that. Man, that actually kind of rubs me the wrong way, kind of makes me mad. Maybe you come into the house of God, you hear the preacher and he's getting in your face and you're saying, what's this guy getting on my back for? Why is, why is he got to be like that? Why are they getting all red in the face? Why is the veins popping out of their forehead? Man, what's going on? Are they mad at me? Is God mad at me? No, listen, God is getting in your face. God's all up in your grill. Why? Because God wants to get you in line with his word so that he can use you. So I got a little San Bernardino on you. But listen, God will get in our lives. God will get his finger on issues. And even though we don't like it always, the reason why God is all up in the Kool-Aid is because he knows the flavor. <laughs> now we're talking. God wants to use you. God wants to do great and mighty things in your life. But God wants you to live a separate, holy, exclusive life. Three things that we learned today. Number one, we learned that an exclusive life is a complete life. Holy, completely open to God. There's not a room in our heart, not a corner in our life that God does not have access to. Second thing is that an exclusive life is a concentrated life that we are ever attentive towards the things of God. And finally, we learn that an exclusive life is a clean life. That when we link up with the Spirit of God and God starts pointing out areas in our life that we start to clean up our act and do what God has called us to do. Now, if you got something from God today, let's give him a great big praise. Hallelujah. I haven't asked no one to get up, no one to leave during this time. I want to make sure that you give God your full attention. Come on, you can give God a couple more minutes. I've only been in church about an hour and seven minutes. You've been in movies longer than that, okay? So just stay put for a couple more minutes, and then we'll let you go, okay? I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Here's the question. Let's say you died today. Today was your last day on the earth, okay? Hypothetically, what if? Where would you end up? Would you go to heaven? Or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. Now let's examine your answer because your answer tells a lot about where you're at with God. Somebody in this room said, well, pastor, I think I'd go to heaven. Somebody said, hmm, I hope I'd go to heaven. Somebody said, well, maybe I'd go to heaven. I really don't know. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. So what does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. and You got to get there God's way. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can think, hope, or maybe your way into the kingdom of God. You've got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Somebody in this room said, well, I, I know I'm going to go to heaven because I've been a good person. And God lets good people into heaven. Really? Show me that in the Bible. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough, do good deeds, help people out, encourage people, smile at your neighbor, give money to charity. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to get to heaven. Because the standard is perfection, and the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, you're not going to get there just by being good. So he said, well, not only have I been good, Pastor, but I was raised in church. Parents took me to church as a child, told me we were Christians. Had me baptized or christened as a child. Hung religious jewelry like a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Took you to religious classes like Sabbath school or catechism class or Sunday school. And you were born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religion. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, your parents tell you you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wore religious jewelry, went to religious classes, or that because you were born in America that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And I don't find anywhere in the Bible that it says that because you're not some other religion, that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian headed for heaven and denying hell not going to make it. And I love you enough to tell you the truth today. Some of you said, well, okay, pastor, I understand that. But not only when I was a child did I go to church, but here I am as an adult and I'm in church right now. I mean, I'm sitting in church and I, I considered myself to be a Christian. I go to church. It's great. I'm glad that you do. But show me in the Bible where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It doesn't work. Any more than you can go down the ocean, sit in the water and call yourself a fish. And that makes you a fish. 
Nowhere in the Bible does it say, sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You say, okay, I, I got that, but at my last church I was involved, Pastor. I didn't just attend church and sit, but I did something, you know, just like you were talking about doing something. I did something. I helped out. I sang in the choir. I taught in the Bible classes. People thought of me as a leader. I carried the pastor's Bible and made decisions in that church. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Again, I'm glad you did those things, but show me in the Bible where church involvement gets you into heaven. It's not there. No one in the Bible say help out, sing in the choir, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, carry the pastor's Bible, teach in the classes. You get to go to heaven. Not going to make it. No one in the Bible does it say that you get a membership card and when you enter the gates of heaven, God is checking your card at the door. It doesn't work like that. No one in the Bible does it say church involvement gets you in heaven. And I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough today to tell you the truth and not play games. You're not going to make it. So we said, okay, pastor, I understand all that, but somebody told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. And I know God. I mean, I, I just celebrated Easter, celebrate Christmas, and sing the songs every year of my life. I, I, I could quote scriptures to you. I, I, I know God. Therefore, I'm a Christian headed for heaven. But if you'd read your Bible, you would know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, even quotes scriptures in the Bible, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you into heaven because of what you know. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart, beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. God wants your heart. Jesus came to a man by the name of Nicodemus, who was a really good guy. I mean, Nicodemus was a religious leader of his day. He was raised up in his church. He did good things. He got involved in his church. He became a leader. He was a teacher of Israel. This guy was a good guy. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. He could debate the scripture. He gave his money. People looked to him to find out about God. And yet when Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, he does not say, hey, Nick, man, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, you must be born again. Now, I know our society has made a mockery out of that statement, be born again. But this is not about what society says. This is not about what Hollywood movies say about being born again. This is about what the Bible says. Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Book of Revelation, last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to the church. Chapter number three, and he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Little token prayer every now and then. Little church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not your everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship, look out because you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today we're doing this God's way. Remember, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But whoever is ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of him. He says, if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to go like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, yes, I need Jesus. I, I want to give him all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be headed for heaven, denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed, Pastor. Uh-huh, you might be. But think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on, today, you can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than being separated from God. Listen, I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God loves you so much he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a tree. And so that you and I could be forgiven of everything we've ever done wrong. But he was raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Today, will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today, make sure. 
Finally, who should raise their hand in a moment? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or on the live stream, come on, you can raise your hand up right where you're at and then tell an usher or come into the church service or on the live stream, I'll pray with you right afterwards. Couldn't get any easier. Let's get ready to get our hands up. Let's get ready to get right with God. Here we go all together on the count of three. Get ready to get your hands up. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. There's where you at? Number two. Come on. There's one wise person already. There's two. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Two wise people already. Up on top. Is that in the family room or back there? Where you at? Got you over there. There's number three. Got you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Number four up on top. Anybody else? Number five, six, seven, eight. Got you all in the family room. Nine over there. Thank you. God bless you guys. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Where you at? Okay, right there. Got you. God bless you. Got you. You can put your hand down. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? There's about nine or ten wise people. Anybody else? You know you need to give God all your heart. You know you need to give God all of your life. Anybody else real quick? I just want to give you an opportunity. If you're sitting there wondering if you should, you should. Come on. Come on. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Anybody else? Pop it up when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else real quick in this section? In this section up on top? Anybody else real quick? Anybody else on this side? Got you. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else over here? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for about 10 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Now, all 10 of you, or if you're number 12, number 13, number 14, number 15, come on, you didn't miss out. There's still time for you too. Here's what I want you to do in a moment. Get your stuff, coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend if you need a friend, whatever you brought with you to church, I want you to get in the aisle and I want you to meet me up front because we're gonna change destinies today, but I need you to come quick. So get your stuff, get in the aisle and meet me up front. You just come right now. If you raised your hand or you should have, you come. You come right now, just come. It's Make your way to the front. They're coming, let's give them a hand. You can come too. From the family rooms, you can bring your kids. Come on down. 